anything. Okay, so we will begin with our uh, first uh, keynote speaker. It's uh, Professor uh, Mahon O'Brien from the University of Sussex. Mahon has written at least four, four books uh, on uh, Heidegger. He specializes uh, on Heidegger, but also more broadly in phenomenology and existentialism. Uh, and he has written many uh, articles uh, and uh, essays. And uh, it is our pleasure uh, to have him here today give his talk. Uh -huh. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I need to share it, right? Uh, it's always a zoom. You can uh, control it. Yeah. Or just touch it. I think so. And if not, uh, is the camera okay? Camera don't Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's fantastic honor to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone that made this possible, uh, and in particular, Susie and Christos. Uh, I was just chatting to people this morning about the fact that this is, I think, the first time in almost three years I've been at a face-to-face -face conference, so um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I, I'm going to start also with some apologies, um, the, the major one being uh, I'm pretty sleep deprived, so if anything I say doesn't strike you as, as brilliant or really incisive, but that's the key, it's not the weakness of my argument. Um, it's a, an attempt at levity, I'm gonna have to do better. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do this morning, uh, hopefully this will be a reasonable way to introduce things, is, is to try and introduce a, an overall context for Heidegger's invocation of the Zinnung or, or mindfulness and notions like meditative thinking as opposed to calculative thinking. And what I'm going to say, it's insufficient. It's going to involve shortcuts, uh, especially from the standpoint of, of Heidegger specialists. And see that up front, and, and I'm, I'm happy to get into the weeds of that stuff with Heideggerians if they want to. But I thought it was an opportunity to try to state again what's ultimately at stake in Heidegger's thought. And what I'm going to do is, again, going to sound probably a bit strange, and I hope no one will panic. I'm going to start off by looking at this almost imagined dispute between Rudolf Carnap and, and Heidegger. I'm not going to do justice to Carnap's paper, and this isn't a, a patch of job. It's not intended as a series of cheap shots. What, what I want to do is see in the way we imagine how Heidegger did respond, both sort of uh, elliptically, but also directly and in, in unpublished manuscripts, uh, whether or not we can see something interesting developing. So, uh, Carnap's polemic is ostensibly a direct response to Heidegger's inaugural lecture in Freiburg. And Heidegger himself explicitly responds in unpublished drafts of the 1935 uh, lecture course, um, Reproductions and Metaphysics. Uh, and in, uh, in, in the unpublished manuscripts, he, he, he responds directly to Carnap. But in, in the actual published one, which is published in 53, you can see fairly direct references without naming Carnap. So it, it's not an entirely far-fetched enterprise to imagine this almost as, a, as an exchange between them. But the reason that I want to do it is because I think it's an, it, an interesting way of illustrating the continuity of Heidegger's thinking from beginning to end. So again, just to sort of warn people in advance, I'm, I'm a con continuity person when it comes to Heidegger. I, I see far more continuity. Than continuity. Um, um, 
I think it's an interesting way of showing what the enduring relevance of Heidegger's thinking is also with respect to, to the Zinnung. What probably remains less clear, and that's what I'll get around from the second half of the presentation, is what the implications of Heidegger's challenge to the tradition of Western philosophy might be. So beyond the diagnosis of the symptoms of calculative thinking as opposed to what he favors, something like in the text uh, of the same name, mindfulness and meditative thinking, what changes would issue from the attempt to return to the inception of the Western philosophical tradition, in particular taking the notion of nothingness seriously, not least in, in terms of this sort of juxtaposition of, of uh, thinking meditatively as opposed to calculating. So Heidegger opens his most famous and influential work uh, at least I think it is being in time, by posing a question which we're all familiar with concerning the meaning of being, the meaning of the word being. He's already convinced that there's a kind of privileging of presence at work in our sense of what being means, which obfuscates and or distorts the nature of our experiences and indeed our own self-understanding. And he's further convinced that the history of Western metaphysics is dominated by a tendency to privilege presence and to ignore or suppress the absence which is the self-conceived concomitant of any sense of experience or, or sense or experience of presence. And I think that in part explains Heidegger's efforts underlying the importance of absence or nothingness in some of the texts from the late 20s and indeed again in the 30s. And it's very clearly something that he looks to foreground, I think, uh, and it's certainly in the background repeatedly in the text, which is relevant to the theme of, of our conference, um, uh, the Zinnum uh, or mindfulness. Okay, so in a 1935 lecture course, Oops. Oh, stand here. oh, I was supposed to play that one already. Sorry. Um, he begins with or revisits Leibniz's question. Why are there beings at all instead of nothing? And it's typically assumed that this is the first question for metaphysics. But the problem is when we pose this question of being and non-being or nothing, we don't, Heidegger believes, have an adequate understanding of the word being. There's a prior question that needs to be addressed before we can understand, even address Leibniz's question. What do we mean by that word? What does this word, which is so commonly invoked, actually mean? Now, one obvious answer is something like constantly present, extant. For that reason, Leibniz's own question can focus on the simple issue of presence versus absence, and takes it as a given that it reduces to or is synonymous with the uh, question of being versus nothingness. Nothingness now understood as the negation of being. It takes being to already be determined as constant presence, the constancy of what appears in the appearance, which can then be represented and correctly judged or understood. So in the question, why are there beings and not nothing? The focus should be on what we mean there by the term are, so the cognate of the word. Instead, we assume that we can restate the question as, that, as though all we meant was by being and not nothing, as though nothing is the negation of being, where being is like a thing and refers to the constancy of its presence. Now, Heidegger locates this problem, rightly or wrongly, at the very inception of Western metaphysics, where a decisive move is made in terms of what we mean by being in the direction of the constancy of what appears in the appearance, which in turn is judged according to its strategic correctness and represented. So he writes, this is in mindfulness, since the superficialization of the first beginning of Occidental thinking, the most traversed and traversable path towards the termination of being is marked by the opposition of being to becoming. In this way, the interpretation of being as not becoming in the sense of permanence, permanence immediately comes to light. Being means constancy and presence. So being is thereby understood as the being of beings understood as constantly, continuously present or extant. So the gaze that fastens on what remains and stands before us as unconcealed, then forgets that there was initially concealedness before something was unconcealed, it was concealed. Now Heidegger will even try to show that there are hints and clues of our own self-awareness of this self-effacing occluded concealedness. That is what is not revealed as actualized or present in that sense, in our most immediate experience of anything. So in, in Sign and Sight, in, in Being and Time, he scavenges through our everyday experience looking for the traces of this hidden backdrop to disclosure, the veiled coordinates that underlie the explicit coordinates we use to navigate our way around the world. For Heidegger, our most basic dispositional capacity for interpretation is such that we are fundamentally attuned 
to the absence which surrounds all presence. I'm going to use language I shouldn't hear, and I apologize, as a condition for the possibility of anything that we can then turn towards as meaningfully present. This nothingness is something that stalks us as the uncanny shadow of all of our directed experience of things taken to be present. Furthermore, according to Heidegger, this or something like this is the most basic or a version of the most basic form of nothingness from which negation itself is derived. Now, Heidegger repeatedly challenges what he takes to be stock objections to his philosophy, which rely, for example, on the principle of non-contradiction. Since that approach for Heidegger has already conflated being with actuality or something like that. So the principle of non-contradiction then is routinely invoked to dismiss all talk of the nothing as simply wrongheaded. After all, the talk of nothing as being in any way is to treat it as a present thing, treated as something, which is of course contradictory. And again, for Heidegger, this is already to have decided in advance that being is present in the way that an ordinary object is present or that it is itself a being and not nothing. What Heidegger is trying to show is that when we begin to think philosophically, we often don't realize that we have already accepted certain fairly significant presuppositions which have major implications for philosophy and the way it has unfolded. It began, at least this is what Heidegger argues, with the ancient Greeks who, when thinking through some basic fundamental questions, took the being of things as referring to their constant presence, their availability to view, their constancy as being actually present. I'm painting with broad strokes more nuanced than that, just to tell that something like the basic story. Being comes then to be understood as constant presence, and as a consequence, everything revolves around our correct apprehension and judgments concerning that which is constantly present there before us. But Heidegger is convinced that even if we consider our own experience, we can detect that something else is at work. Our basic affective state suggests that we are already somehow aware of more than what appears to be continuously present. Before we turn toward the actuality of what is present, Heidegger thinks there is an antecedent awareness of what that presence emerges out of. What everything that emerges stamped with meaning is surrounded by, and that is absence or nothingness, in effect, meaninglessness. It's not itself a thing, of course, it is no thing. And thus speaking about nothing can appear to tie us up in knots since it can instantly look as though we've tried to substantivize nothing, to hypostatize it. To, re to treat it as a thing rather than no thing. But this is because we tend to speak in a language, again, this is part of an argument he makes, which is already assumed that when we speak of the being of anything, when we say that anything is, that we are substantivizing it, claiming that it is present in the manner of a thing, or that we have, as Carnap suggests, treated nothing as though it were a noun, as though it can be substantive, that it is present as an actual thing. Heidegger, you, you recall, uh, uh, began to write the term under a ratio with an X crossed out to try and draw attention to this. It's also odd that kind of appears to have ignored Heidegger's own discussion of this very objection within the very paper that he's attacking. Heidegger instead wants to advert to a kind of aboriginal experience, which is the context against which we should understand each instance and occasion of things emerging as meaningfully present. In short, again, we should recall that uncanny experience we have of the utter meaninglessness finitude, and thus not the eternally present unchanging underlying traditions. The abgrund, or this, which is in the background of all of our efforts to establish meaning, to make sense. Our lives are directed then by background influences which attest to that awareness of our own finitude and thus the limits to world, world here understood as a central meaningful horizon. Nothing is set in stone in terms of the meaningful nature of the world, but underlies everything is not something permanently present, some kind of arche in metaphysics. Rather, what lies behind everything is nothingness and the fact that meaning happens continually against that background, against that abgrund, the meaningless backdrop to all meaningful presence. The authentic augenblick or the, the, the authentic moment is a jarring moment, a jolt that we can all instantly relate to where the reality of the utter lack of meaningfulness which sits at the edge of our meaningful world suddenly looms up before us. This moment gives us a snapshot into how the structure of our meaningful world is itself expressive of the way meaningful presence is constantly run through with absence, that the being of anything understood as meaningful presence is a kind of pres-absence. This is a thought that Heidegger struggles to make clear throughout his career and his continuing attempts to find a way to express the same thought leads to ever more involved and experimental attempts to clarify his fundamental claim, which relates to our experience, 
of the abyss, which stands as a sort of counterpoint to all that we take to be meaningful. That is the ultimate self-effacing ground of all meaningfulness. The irony here is that Carnap identifies Heidegger as the archetypical metaphysical philosopher when Heidegger's entire philosophical raison d'etre is to question and challenge Western metaphysics. Indeed, from Heidegger's point of view, he might argue that it's Carnap himself who's operating with unwarranted metaphysical assumptions which prop up his own logical approach to these philosophical problems. The belief that this notion of nothing or any discussion of it is self-contradictory rests on a mis misunderstanding or more to the point on an unquestioned presupposition. The question of nothingness has always gone hand in hand with the question of being. But Heidegger wants to challenge the assumption that nothingness and any understanding we can have of it is derived from the knot of negation as Carnap contends. So we normally begin with beings. They are immediately interrogated as their ground. The question advances directly toward the ground. Such a method just broadens and enlarges, as it were, a procedure that is practiced every day. Somewhere in the vineyard, for example, an infestation turns up, something indisputably present at hand. One asks, where does this come from? Where and what is its ground? Similarly, as a whole, beings are present at hand. One asks, where and what is the ground? This kind of questioning is represented in the simple formula, why are there beings? Where and what is their ground? Tacitly, one is asking after another higher being. But there, the question does not pertain at all to beings as a whole and as such. So we begin with things that are there for us and immediately begin to wonder as to why they are there. What is the cause of these beings? And traditionally, that line of questioning sort of terminates or is closed off with the idea of a higher being that causes or that caused all of the other beings. But it misses something for Heidegger since it glosses over the, the question as to what we mean by being and simply asks for the cause, the why of things that are present, are caused or created, that are extant. This is to assume that what being means when we say beings are reduces to something like presence understood as full actualization. And again, we've then taken for granted precisely the issues that Heidegger thinks are open to further questioning. He restates that view in mindfulness. Man's own most increasingly and securely advances towards animality and the godhead of gods becomes divinity, understood as the prime cause and as that which conditions, that is, that which explains and includes all calculated. In his 1935 lecture course, Introduction to Metaphysics, in order to illustrate his point with respect to the role of the nothing in terms of what it means for anything to be, he takes an immediate example from the lecture hall. Probably significant that we can't do it today because there's no chalk in there. But, um, Anyway, the piece of chalk here is an extended, relatively stable, definitely formed grayish white thing, and furthermore, a thing for writing, as certainly as it belongs precisely to this thing to lie here, the capacity not to be here and not to be so big also belongs to it. The possibility of being drawn along the blackboard and used up is not something that we merely add on to the thing, but our thought. The chalk itself, as this being, is in this possibility, otherwise it would not be chalk as a writing instrument. Every being, in turn, has this possible in it in a different way in each case. This possible belongs to the chalk. In other words, what the chalk is, what we mean when we say that the chalk is in various ways, means more than simply stating that the chalk is statically present in full actuality and thereby exhausted in that way. Now granted, the piece of chalk is actually there in various ways, but it can also be understood in all manner of possible ways that involve more than what is precisely present or actualized or extant at any given moment ways that could actually be actualized, but are not yet. Moreover, this is a fundamental part of what it means for things to be. Heidegger is interested in meaningful presence, and the way things emerge as meaningfully present involves a constant interplay of presence and absence. Their meaning is not exhausted in actuality. Part of what is present is or are absences. The thinghood of the chalk is not exhausted in its actuality, but rather it is a piece of chalk in virtue of it being a thing as thing, as a piece of chalk, which involves its possibilities, its past and future uses, its in order to structure, the many and various facets of its thinghood which are not exhausted in its actuality. Heidegger then goes on to ask, how are we even supposed to inquire into the ground for the being of beings, let alone be able to find it out, if we have not adequately conceived, understood, and grasped being itself? So it turns out that the question 
why are there beings at all instead of nothing forces us to the prior question how does it stand with being what about this being we've inherited a philosophical tradition which for its all its variety variance breadth and so on took its impetus so heidegger claims from an underlying kind of prejudice that being means something like constant presence and that we can only have access to or can only think about what is unconcealed or disclosed and forget entirely the concealedness which includes itself in the appearing of the unconcealed. Okay, so Carnap dismisses this line of thinking on the basis of a pretty uncharitable reading of a particular passage in Heidegger's 1959 inaugural lecture, what is meant. And when you begin to examine his criticisms closely, being fair to Carnap here, I do think it's fairly clear that he's operating with something of a caricature of Heidegger's view. So, I mean, there's plenty of work done. You can look at someone like Michael Friedman's book, who confirms that Carnap repeatedly claimed to have studied being and time closely, and one has to take him at his word on that. And, and he and Heidegger uh, got on quite well in 1929 in Davos, uh, Heidegger zero debate. But there seems to be little evidence of that careful study in his assessment of Heidegger's 1929 lecture. Carnap argues instead that Heidegger's prose trades in a metaphysical nonsense, which one finds in a good deal of post-Kantian German philosophy. And once you clear up the linguistic confusion cluttering the scene of that kind of thinking, the residue of the ensuing pseudo problems just washes away. So Carnap defines things thus. Sorry, I, I forgot to put in the full reference for that, but it's a very famous paper. So you can use it. In the strict sense, a sequence of words is meaningless if it does not, within a specified language, constitute a statement. It may happen that such a sequence of words looks like a statement at first glance. In that case, we call it a pseudo statement. Our thesis now is that logical analysis reveals the alleged statements of metaphysics to be pseudo statements. And he next seeks to define language. A language consists of a vocabulary and a syntax, that is, a set of words which have meanings and rules of sentence formation. These rules indicate how sentences may be formed out of various sorts of words. Accordingly, there are two kinds of pseudo statements. Either they contain a word which is erroneously believed to have meaning or the constituent words are meaningful, yet are put together in a counter syntactical way so that they do not yield a meaningful statement. So Carnap wants to show that, uh, quote, metaphysics in its entirety consists of such pseudo statements, unquote. And he proceeds to analyze a series of statements that he stitches together from Heidegger's 29 lecture and characterizes them as an example of the example par excellence of a metaphysician deceived sort of by the surface grammar of their own prose, uh, reproducing ultimately nonsense. And so th this is the way he puts together some statements from Heidegger. That's as good as it gets with me on PowerPoint, so I hope people appreciate that. That's the nothing. <laughs> as good as it gets. <laughs> Okay, what is to be investigated is being only and nothing else, being alone and further nothing, solely being and beyond being nothing. What about this nothing? Does the nothing exist only because the not, that is, the negation exists? Or is it the other way around? Does negation and the not exist only because the nothing exists? We assert the nothing is prior to the not and the negation. Where do we seek the nothing? How do we find the nothing? We know the nothing, anxiety reveals the nothing. That for which and because of which we were anxious was really nothing. Indeed, the nothing itself as such was present. What about this nothing? The nothing itself, nothings. Now, when Heidegger says that the nothing annihilates or the nothing nothings in, in that series of statements, he's explicitly rejecting the idea that the nothing and negation have the meaning that Carnap wishes to confer on them. And that already forestalls any variation on the claim that this issue neatly dissolves if you rewrite any of the offending statements by translating them into other statements that appear to have the same meaning, which can then, for example, be expressed when you're using words. Under something like that formulation, one might say that there's no problem at all, and that in a sufficiently philosophically respectable language that conforms to the rules of logical syntax, one does not have to posit the presence of absence in the first place. Heidegger is openly and within the same text deeply dissatisfied with that kind of approach. For Heidegger, even to properly, understand, to properly understand the true nature of the thing as a thing involves an interplay of presence and absence. This is part of what we mean when we make certain statements or experience things as things. 
even when it comes to the being of the human being, and he's constantly trying to underline or bring out the phenomenological testimony for this and being applied to his analysis of Dasein. Part of what it means for us to be and to understand and interpret at any given moment is to have a sense of something constantly outstanding, that there is absence. He describes this as the null basis of a nullity. We exist in some sense as a lack and experience absence during every moment of our existence. Karna, however, assumes that nothingness is equivalent to something like the negation of being, and that is precisely what Heidegger wants to challenge. With this much assumed, and according to the rules of logical syntax, as Karna defines them, some of Heidegger's statements appear system syntactically problematic. But again, that's only once you've accepted certain presuppositions concerning the meaning of terms like being and nothing. Karna further insists that Heidegger uses the word nothing in an entirely conventional way. Now, granted, Heidegger's first use of the word nothing that he quotes there appears to be conventional, but it's manifestly inaccurate, I think, to suggest that the word nothing in the rest of the passage is only used in such a way as to betoken the standard and logically respectful invocation of negation, as Karna contends. So uh, Jim Conant has a, a nice text on this and summarizes the fundamental problem with Karnap's analysis as follows. Carnap's elaborate analysis of the different contexts in which the term nothing can occur in ordinary language is scarcely credible as an account of how Heidegger is led to employ the word nothing as he does here. It won't do to say of Heidegger's sentences that the fact that the rules of grammatical syntax of ordinary language are not violated is what seduces one into the erroneous opinion that one still has to do with the statement. Such a diagnosis would be blind to the stunningly virtuoso character of Heidegger's employment of the word, even when judged by the allegedly comparatively permissive lights of ordinary grammatical syntax. This virtuosity renders Heidegger's text utterly unsuitable as an example of that of which it was allegedly introduced as an example, the surreptitious misuse of language. Heidegger is evidently speaking here in an unusual way. Conant charges Carnap then with a certain disingenuousness in singling out the statements in question. Um, did I read that last one? I think yeah, sorry, openly forcing his readers to check on how it was meant. Yeah, sorry, I got distracted by a fly. So, uh, Conant charges Carnap then with a certain disingenuousness in singling out the statements in question as a perfect example of the kind of nonsensical metaphysical statements which he suggests that metaphysicians have unwittingly made in the past. Um, he said a nice line on this. Carnap's, and this is Conant. Again, Carnap's analysis tends to the supposition that Heidegger's words are employed by him in nothing other than their usual senses. The problem then becomes one of seeing how it is that the author could imagine that he, Heidegger, was employing words in their usual senses. And he zeroes in on a specific passage from the paper that ostensibly addresses this difficulty. Um, in view of the gross logical errors we find in Heidegger's text, we might be led to the conjecture that perhaps the word nothing has in Heidegger's treatise a meaning entirely different from the customary one. And this presumption is further strengthened as we go on to read that anxiety reveals the nothing, that the nothing itself is present as such an anxiety. For here, the word nothing seems to refer to a certain emotional constitution, possibly of a religious sort, or something or other that underlies such emotions. If such were the case, then the mentioned logical errors would not pertain. But the first sentence of the quotation at the beginning of this section proves that this interpretation is not possible. The combination of only and nothing else shows unmistakably that the word nothing here has the usual meaning of a logical particle that serves for the formulation of a negative existential statement. And Conant goes on to insist that Carnap is clearly wrong to insist that Heidegger employs the term nothing in just this one way, which is crucial to the latter's claim that Heidegger is unwittingly guilty of lapsing into nonsense. Heidegger clearly states that the notion of negation is itself derived from a prior experience of nothingness. In other words, we must, Heidegger believes, already have a sense or understanding of nothingness from which the act of negation is derived. And he's gone to some pains to establish that if being is not itself a thing, then the notion of being is not some thing to be distinguished from nothingness in view of its extentness or actuality. Heidegger reminds us in the same passage that this prior experience of the nothing is disclosed in anxiety. In other words, all meaningful presence, every kind of disclosure available to us, is already prefigured by the absence which precedes it and awaits it. Our experience of meaningful presence is run through with absence, 
which is part of how it is disclosed as meaningful in the first place. The very notion of presence understood now as unconcealedness carries the trace of the concealed out of which it emerged, being understood as the unconcealed and as meaningfully present, not itself a thing. To be in that sense is not to be actual in that sense, and thus nothingness cannot be understood as simply the negation of what is unconcealed. Concealedness comes before the unconcealed and, co and constitutes part of what the unconcealed means. And in any case, uh, in neither situation are we talking about a thing. So no thing cannot be the negation of being as though it were something. Okay, so then in terms of moving on to mindfulness and meditative thinking as, to, as opposed to calculated thinking, uh, which is, I think, revisiting a lot of that problematic. If we were to usher in an age like that, would Carnap's concerns simply vanish or dissolve as pseudo problems in their own right? Would we be able to think, for example, outside of the strictures of the principle of non-contradiction? What are the notions of mindfulness and meditative thinking in the context of Heidegger's overall project? Okay, so mindfulness we know is a translation of Brazil. It's a key term for Heidegger. However, it's not clear how Heidegger would relate that term to what we think of sometimes as mindfulness today. Um, there are passages, for example, in the memorial address where he outlines the posture of Gelassenheit, uh, sometimes translated as releasement, which probably resonates. So if you consider uh, this characteristically, sorry, uncharacteristically sanguine passage from Heidegger's speech to the residents of Nisker. But will not saying both yes and no this way to technical devices make our relation to technology ambivalent and insecure? On the contrary, our relation to technology will become wonderfully simple and relaxed. We let technical devices enter our daily life and at the same time leave them outside, that is, let them alone, as things which are nothing absolute but remain dependent upon something higher. I would call this comportment toward technology, which expresses yes and at the same time no, by an old word, releasement to think toward things. At the same time, it's not clear that we should think of Heidegger here as calling for a period of something like uh, therapeutic meditation. Uh, and it's not clear that he's trying to offer a self-help manual or a panacea for those overwrought with the pressures of contemporary life. Indeed, I mean, the very fact that there are mindfulness apps for your smartphone suggests that the link between, let's say, that trivial version of mindfulness uh, and Heidegger's attempts to challenge calculated thinking are probably quite far apart. Uh, there, there are more interesting parallels to be drawn. I'm sure some people at the conference will, uh, will draw some of those out and, and the intersections are, are interesting. Although interesting as well to notice, Heidegger himself kind of, as an aside, every so often rules out the attempts ever to do that. But whether that's legitimate is a different question. In any case, he takes the trouble to write a rather long, sprawling, and often unwieldy collection of notes and fragments on the notion of Brazilian. Um, I apologize to anyone in advance who's going to describe it as a, you know, a master in Brazilian's text. Uh, I've been guilty of, of disparaging texts before that other people, Heideggerians, have said were wonderful tapestries. Um, I, I don't think it is, uh, but it, it's interesting. Heidegger is again and again desperately trying to explain the basic impulse behind his thinking concerning the obscured meaning of being, the concomitant question of nothingness, the interplay of presence and absence, the idea of rewinding back through the tradition of metaphysics to its inception. In order to think through these various notions, something like mindfulness or, and or meditative thinking is needed. To an extent, mindfulness for Heidegger is the reflective question of a thinking which is not already conflated being with actuality, and thereby distinguished it from absence understood as its negation, that is, as the opposite of being. Instead, it would be a thinking that understands the enormity of the implications of thinking through the ontological difference, that being is not itself a being, and that the being of something, or for example, its emergence is meaningfully present, frequently involves an interplay of presence and absence. So if we think back to the, the chalk example, not the most imaginative, but bear with me. The chalk is in terms of possibilities that are not yet actualized, but they are part of what it means for that chalk to be the chalk it currently is. So in thinking carefully about the nature of thing as a thing, one can free oneself to an extent from the idea that what we mean by any thing that we intend, jobs that we see, for example, 
is the constancy of what appears as present in the appearance, since part of what we mean or intend are facets and aspects and possibilities that are not actually relevant at that moment. The jug is a jug like the one I've seen before, which I plan to use perhaps as a vessel for water or wine. Uh, this was, in a sense, the point of the discussion of the in order to structure and the ready to hand nature of our everyday engagement with things in, in being in time. The jug will be filled shortly. It will then be empty again later. So there's a kind of historical dimension to the way it is disclosed to me as present, which involves the constant interplay of present and absence. Whereas calculated thinking emerges from a tradition which, painting with broad strokes, has fastened on the disclosed part of disclosure and fixated on the idea of what appears as constantly present in the appearance, as though it were constantly statically present, and thus overlooks or forgets the historical nature of the thing that we experience as the thing. It can then focus on the, pro focus on the properties and the fabric, the material constitution, and the causal considerations relevant to that thing, which is to think calculatedly, which can allow it to be reckoned and positioned in various ways. Now, you see another key notion uh, that might be relevant here uh, or associated with mindfulness of being in the moment. Uh, I, again, I'll leave it to others to elaborate on, on the interesting intersections that might obtain here. And what I say, I hope the next is glaringly obvious. I take it that it goes without saying that we'd already be on something of a fool's errand if we thought that or we remained hidebound to the chronological sense of time without really thinking through what Heidegger refers to as the time character of our experience, presence, which already contains traces of the absence, which is part of the meaningful presence of disclosure. Indeed, if one has not tracked what Heidegger means in terms of the constant interplay of presence and absence, then the idea of staying in the moment would degenerate into something as preposterous as the impossible aspiration of freezing oneself statically in the now. If our lives are lived and understood meaningfully as always in some kind of movement process, then we can only be present in any moment as pres absent beings, as the null basis of a nullity. We are no thing at every moment of our existence. The only way we could be as things is as bioanthropological things, which is not a way that we, the Dasein here, can be. We can only ever be misinterpreted in such ways by others. This is only something, as Heidegger repeatedly states, that the animal can be. The human being understood as Dasein is exempt from, quote, any comparison with the animal and with the merely living. The almost of man is removed from animality. And earlier in the same text, he writes, the more fundamentally man's almost is rested free of animality and spirituality, the more he is allotted into the inabiding, understood as the intimate, persevering, in the grounding of the truth of being. Letting beings be must be kept furthest removed from any cajoling of what is presently actual, effective, and successful. So then thinking about some of this in the context of the technological age, which becomes a, a major concern for him for much most of the second half of his, his uh, professional life. So what would it mean to overcome calculated thinking in the technological age? In what ways would the current dominion of technology over our lives shift or change? Are Heidegger's view so impoverished in terms of his understanding of economics and politics, for example, as to be visible in their own right? Everything we understood as Tom Sheehan once put the subspecies metaphysically. What would the notion of Gelassenheit introduced or discussed in the memorial address actually entail? If we are to say yes and no to technology in, this, in the era of high-speed internet, smartphones, smart rooms, smart houses, smart boards in the classroom, smart TVs, 5G, et cetera, et cetera, what would saying no amount to? Once we've recognized what he calls a saving power, do we in some ways automatically impede the very force that technological development needs to sustain itself and thereby to resist what he calls a number of times the unchanged frenzy of technology? And do we only manage this by understanding again Heidegger's exhaustive attempts to return to the beginning of Western metaphors? Let's consider the question put to Heidegger concerning the technological age by uh, the interviewers from Der Spiegel in 1966. One could make the following quite naive rejoinder. What is to be overcome here? Everything is functioning. More and more power plants are being built. We have peak production. People in the highly technological parts of the world are well provided for. We live in prosperity. What is really missing here? 
And what they're challenging in a way is the idea that we should be so swayed by all the harbingers of doom or, or, or there's some dystopian, uh, futuristic dystopian nightmare. Heidegger's response is more nuanced than one might suppose at first glance, and it would be a mistake to dismiss it as just a lot of grand diligent sort of posturing or cheap puffing. He says everything is functioning. This is exactly what is so uncanny that everything is functioning and that the functioning drives us more and more to even further functioning and that technology tears people loose from the earth and uproots them. I do not know whether you were frightened, but I at any rate was when I saw pictures coming from the moon to the earth. We don't need any atom bomb. The uprooting of human beings has already taken place. The only thing we have left are purely technological relationships. This is no longer the earth in which human beings live. As you know, I recently had a long conversation with René Char of the Provence, the poet and resistance fighter. Rocket bases are being built in the Provence and the country is being devastated in an incredible way. This poet, who certainly cannot be suspected of sentimentality and of the glorification of the idyllic, tells me that the uprooting of man which is taking place there will be the end if poetry and thought do not once more succeed to a position of might without force. So Heidegger responds by deploying the notion of uncanniness and Heimlichkeit. That is to say that it is this very functionality, the collapsing of distance and difficulty, the burgeoning of convenience culture that is so uncanny. He alludes then to the very heart of his theoretical analysis of the essence of the technological age and his gestures toward the possibility of a saving power through his invocation of a different poetic or, or poetic form of revealing, concurring with Char's suggestion that poetry and thinking is 10 minutes okay. Yes, is that a, a calculation? Yeah, it's a calculated but... <laughs> Yeah, I can yeah, um, That poetry and thinking was once more sent to a position of might without force. Heidegger's interviewers represent a certain point of view. We hear it again in the responses of critics who might rejoin But how is this anything more than the typical sentimentality of a curmudgeonly crank? After all, has it not always been the case that human beings can misappropriate or misuse or corrupt any important discovery? Airplanes can be used to deliver weapons of devastation to far from the regions of the planet, but the issue is highly the airplane itself. Heidegger repeatedly anticipates these kinds of responses and explains that they don't touch on what is relevant to his concerns. Rather, Heidegger's issue is with the way the world is revealed to people in an age where airplanes shrink the planet such that a trip between countries uh, is no more than the one-time excursion into town for the country dweller of 100 years hence. Can we begin to imagine what might happen if we were not here to develop the organs How might things be otherwise? After all, is it not the case that atomic and then subatomic approaches to things, the application of mathematical theory as a way of simplifying phenomena has led to extraordinary breakthroughs? Surely what we're witnessing everywhere is progress. Things are better, are they not? Do we actually have a better understanding of everything now? If we think about education for a moment, something we're probably all pretty heavily invested in. For all of our online platforms, accessibility, lectures recorded for convenience, writing resources, learning resources, every conceivable aid or tool to make the student's life easier. Everything simply there, on hand, instantaneously. Is it the case that we're seeing better students, better essays, more articulate students, more learned and erudite students than ever before? Maybe all of you are, I'm, I'm not. Um, they're great, but not, they're not the most erudite. Or are they certainly don't write better than anyone ever before, so I'm not sure the convenience is working. Despite the many and various confident proclamations of progress and advancement, what if what we're really describing is ever in greater mastery over areas that we continue to shrink, where we keep narrowing the scope of our view, from the view of the naked eye to the magnifying glass and the microscope until we arrive at the atom, from there to the subatomic. And at each stage, a triumphalist declaration of further progress as though we're getting closer and closer to the thing in itself. But what if the increase in mastery is in some ways blocking our ability to notice something else? We simply in accord with the tendency that began with the understanding of being as constant presence, keep looking for more and further exactitude by fastening with an asphyxiating grip on the more precise, what can be taken to be more correct, understood with even greater exactitude, because even more constant and fixable under this laser-like gaze, as we zero in relentlessly on what we can grasp with even more control and certainty. We're dealing with what is even narrower and less changeable, what is most constant and fixable, or fixed, within the most constant and penetrating and focused of gazes. I, I sometimes think of it as like the, the action of a, a vice grip. 
So you, you've got the teeth the device tightening and squeezing more and more and greater and greater pressure so that it pieces wood that it's gripping. But now suppose you're sitting on a tree swaying in a storm and you've got the vice grip attached to a branch. Would you say you've got better control of the tree just because the vice grip is tightening further and further? The analogy is forced. It's not the end of the argument. There's plenty that one could say against this way of thinking. I'm just trying to characterize what I take to be Heidegger's challenge or problem here. Ultimately, one can only think about these questions, I think, as part of Heidegger's central project concerning the meaning of the term being and the concomitant attempt to call into question the history of the metaphysics of presence. Meditative thinking pitted against calculated thinking must be understood in this context of his attempt to return to the very inception of the Western metaphysics. And it is only in this way that one can begin to properly understand what is most problematic about the technological age, which is nothing technological. It's too simplistic to suppose that he's advocating a return to a, a very sort of agrarian or lifestyle or anything like that. He makes it very clear that that's not his aim despite his own personal proclivities. Computers, airplanes, trains, automobiles, life-saving medical treatment, these are not things to sniff at despite what people like Adorno and, uh, and Habermas say if I could do it. We can't eliminate technology from our lives. He writes, for all of us, the arrangements, devices, and machinery of technology are to a greater or lesser extent indispensable. It would be foolish to attack technology blindly. It would be short-sighted to condemn it as the work of the devil. We depend on technical devices. They even challenge us to ever greater advances. But suddenly and unaware, we find ourselves so firmly shackled to these technical devices that we fall into bondage to them. Still, we can act otherwise. We can use technical devices and yet with proper use, keep ourselves also keep ourselves so free of them that we may let go of them any time. We can use technical devices as they ought to be used and also let them alone as something which does not affect our inner and real core. We can affirm unavoidable use of technical devices and also deny them the right to dominate us and so to warp, confuse and lay waste our nature. So it's not technology per se, but the eliminative character of the essence of technology that concerns how to as he makes clear again at the beginning of the Bremen lectures, we must learn to let things be as things. And that involves more than reducing them through the ordinances of Gestell, but to see them as things that emerge as meaningfully present for us within an historical context, which involves the making present of what is absent as part of what it is for a thing to be a thing. He uses the example of the jug. Uh, so I'll just jump to that. Sorry, this is a rather long one. He, that is the potter, forms the emptiness. For this emptiness within it and from out of it, he shapes the clay into a figure. Potter grasps first and constantly what is ungraspable in the empty and produces it as what holds the form of a vessel. The empty of the jug determines every grip of the production. The thinghood of the vessel by no means rests in the material of which it consists, but instead in the emptiness that holds. But is the jug really empty? The physical science is the surest that the jug is filled with air and with all that constitutes the compound mixture of air. As soon as we investigate the actual jug scientifically and in regards to its actuality, then another state of affair shows itself. If we pour wine into the jug, we merely force out the air that already fills the jug and replace it with the fluid. Viewed scientifically, fill the jug means to exchange one filling for another. These suppositions of physics are correct. By means of them, science represents something actual according to which it objectively judges. But is this actual something the jug? No, science only ever encounters that which its manner of representation has previously admitted as a possible object for itself. Instead of a jug filled with wine, science puts in its place a cavity in which a fluid expands. Science makes the jug thing into something negligible insofar as the thing, then here as the thing which is meant, is not admitted as a standard. So I think it's rather large somewhere. I'm, I'm almost finished, but pages. Um, the attempt to insist exclusively on that kind of scientific understanding of things, he, he argues that it uh, confuses different realms of understanding and meaningfulness. In other words, one substitutes a causal and material account, which explains how certain processes work for what we mean when we experience or invoke a thing as a thing. That is to dismiss the semantic sense of the phenomenological experience of like the, the intentional object in favor of an account of what constitutes certain objects. But of course, when I see a jug on a kitchen table, I don't see the material composition of a vessel filled with air, now understood as a combination of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. It fills the jug. I see the empty jug that we drank from last night. 
And this relates to what Heidegger writes in the origin of the work of art to the effect that we never experience fair auditory or ocular sensations. We never really first perceive a throng of sensations, tones and noises from the appearance of things as this thing concept alleges. Rather, we hear the storm whistling the chimney, we hear the three motor plane, we hear the Mercedes, an immediate distinction from the Volkswagen. Much closer to us than all sensations are the things themselves. We hear the door shut in the house and never hear acoustical sensations or even mere sounds. In order to hear a bare sound, we have to listen away from things, divert our ear, listen abstractly. So again, you can anticipate a rejoinder and, and I'll sort of close off with this line of thinking. Someone might say, we're, well, we're required to make hypotheses in order to get a grip on reality and make sense of it. We make certain presuppositions, we judge things according to how well they enhance our capacity to predict. We secure what we can hold on to. We judge things according to the explanatory success or poverty of these hypotheses and the ensuing chain of inferences or deductions. And it's very hard to see how we might convince ourselves that anything other than necessity a portal into the nature of things as they essentially are is behind all kinds of scientific discoveries. We seem to understand more and science for many is taken then to be in a state of constant cumulative linear progress. What is it? Do we understand things more accurately through a specific kind of interpretive lens or with the clearer and less obstructed view of how things really are? Have we understood trees better simply because we have better methods of growing, harvesting and processing timber? We might be hard pressed to convince someone who's recovered from serious illness that their doctors and the extraordinary research and breakthroughs that facilitated their treatment are doing anything other than proceeding with a better understanding of the body and disease than previous generations. But the question I think Heidegger wants to ask is why should these kinds of understanding require us to overlook other kinds of interpretation? Why should everything else be deemed obsolete or unscientific? The criteria for what counts as relevant grow tighter and tighter, more exact and less intrusive all the time. Our hypothesis and presuppositions, which perhaps have never fundamentally changed in terms of the underlying metaphysical presumptions, are, Heidegger argues, more problematic and loaded than one might suppose. We would look rather foolish to suggest that the extraordinary advances in computing are anything other than advances. But is it possible that we have inadvertently come to believe that the speed with which a computer can process any number of combinations of one and zero? In the background, you could think there about truth tables and things that can be predictions, and do that in a split second and identify an answer is the preeminent way to approach all the problems or questions. Are we enslaved to an extent to the algorithm? Or are we even aware that that approach often prevails only at the expense of other kinds of interpretation? Must we, Heidegger asks, necessarily accede to the insistence that what we experience is what is described in these ways? Or can we retrieve the thing as thing from out of the glimpses we have of what we experience phenomenologically, which indicates something more as meant by us in terms of things being, that is, emerging as things? Moreover, is it really the case that we just try out hypotheses? Is it not rather the case that we begin with certain laws of thought, which we don't take as hypothetical or as assumptions, but rather as necessary in their own right? We then apply these laws of thought to what someone might suggest that we've taken as hypothesis, the only thing we have access to, what appears is constantly present. And yet the laws of thought in question themselves derive from and depend on that notion of constant presence. And what is more, it's simply not the case that all we have access to in our experience is actuality or constant presence. So then, what would mindfulness and meditative thinking, which is in the text with the same title characterized as the appropriate philosophical disposition, what would it bring to the party? How might we begin to see things differently? What would the saving power entail? If absence was part of how we understood things to be meaningfully present or better, if our metaphysical presuppositions had not already conflated being with actuality, with being extant, with being understood as constant presence, how might things have turned out differently? I don't actually know. But perhaps we might begin to finally let things be as things. And perhaps that's where we need to start. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, oh, what did I do? Did you end the meeting? No. <laughs> Mm-hmm.
Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a question. You can see the questions here. And uh, I'll read it out. Um, this is. Well, and we'll give a couple of minutes until someone thinks of a question, comes up with a question. We'll go ahead with this one. Uh, thank you, Mahon, for the insightful. This is Alex Obrigovic. Uh, thank you, Mahon, for the insightful paper. Can you see it here? Yeah. Great. I was wondering if you think the thought of mindfulness and say, say, perhaps impossible attention, attentive and waiting to something like the originary, forgotten, the leafy, the never present, immemorial, and perhaps impossible? Do you think there is something important to do with reflection or attentiveness to a forgetting which was never known or present to memory and abyssal radically anterior absence or impossibility? Start off with an easy one. <laughs> uh, so it's the beginning of the question, I suppose I need to see. Uh, okay, so the, the characterization there is quite nice. I think I agree with the way you characterize things, Alex, and, and you're deploying a lot of sort of Heideggerian, if not terminology, paraphrasing. Um, but what I, I'm wondering a little bit about is the idea of a, an impossible it, attention. Um, is it okay to get them to clarify that? So is the suggestion that what Heidegger is calling for is something that we're not capable of? Because I, I don't think he's saying that. I think he's saying we are capable, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Okay, well, uh, we can move on to the next question until uh, Alex uh, clarifies. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, Dimitri Sportidis has a question. My question based on this report. Clarify uh, at least some clarification from time to time when this uh, was going on in my head. Um, you, <clears throat> if I understood you well, you want to characterize the notion of truth rather than the identify the defined ways to. Make sense of the notion of truth. I identify in a set of these propositions into the world. They are mm -hmm. uh, the shocking that not just. Also, several of these positions that that has been at the same time, uh, being one of the characteristics of truth is uh, constant. So, these two ideas in my head, if I understood, uh, I find conflict oh, yeah, yeah. for so. the reason that. The example I'm thinking of is um, an object made of glass as the description of the mm -hmm. Once I break it, all the rest of the information that I had before so mm -hmm. disappears, hence uh, there is no point. So, yeah. one of the one member of the set of positions that characterize the being of the class yeah. um, contributed so that that being lost its context and changed character. So, okay. I think I understand. Yeah. May uh, I, sorry, may I interject just for a second? Because people are complaining about not uh, hearing properly the questions from the 
if you want to maybe uh, rephrase it or repeat it, yeah. you're closer to the microphone. So I, if, I, if I may, uh, and correct me if I've misunderstood the, but one of the things that you're suggesting is that, uh, that it, one of the characteristics or that the nature of being is, is constancy. And yet in terms of me talking about the being of certain things or, or at least characterizing the way Heidegger wants to talk about the being of certain things, he's getting at things that involve the, the, the rupture of constancy, that there's a conflict then between these two. More technical Aristotelian. Mm -hmm. The moment you put together potentiality with being, mm -hmm. uh, ah, yeah. a, a conflict. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that so so Heidegger would want to challenge for even thinkers like Plato and Aristotle to say that the idea of the constancy comes out of uh, this is too simplistic, but just to, to make a point, comes out of a, a misinterpretation of what's actually happening at the level of the phenomenological experience. And that it's an abstraction. And that when we then describe being what, what we introduce, for example, are things like substance, the, the, the unchanging substrate or the sempiternal substance, or the, if you read Plato this way, I don't, but if you do that the, the eidos or something like that, that which is always constantly there, which is the being of things. That's precisely the thought Heidegger wants to challenge because Heidegger thinks there is no such arche underlying everything. We're thrown, that, and that's the obsession with the time character of things. It, it's not time understood as traditional history, but the, the, the constant uh, undercutting of constancy in terms of what it means to be, we're thrown into a situation where we don't have an epistemological constant principle in view of which things are for us can be in various ways. Radical finitude and that historical indeterminacy making meaning and understanding the being of things without any of those. That's, that's his thought. He, he's, he's challenging traditional metaphysics at the very beginning. It becomes a more complicated story when you want to say, well, where does it exactly start? So he seems to suggest the times it's in Plato. Then the, before that, he seems to suggest that, well, Parmenides and, and, uh, and Heraclitus are, are beginning to move, but that's in a way that's almost irrelevant to, to what I'm trying to describe. But I think I'm trying to get at is that if we take him seriously, so and, and I'm not saying that one has to agree with Heidegger. His, his claim is that the idea of constancy in that way is illusory. I, I hope that makes sense. Uh, Jim Morley, and then we go to Lisa Foran uh, on, the, on the top. Thanks, man. It's a fantastic way to start the conference by right? raising these fundamental metaphysical questions. And um, I'm sort of uh, tranced by what Mel Ponte did with this by putting it in terms of bigger ground terms uh, that uh, non-being and being make each other possible in a reversible way. And I, 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 I was hearing this in what you're, what you're talking about here. I'm mm -hmm. hearing this. And I'm wondering, uh, in light of this, of course, we know that Heidegger was very attracted to Japanese thinking, mm -hmm. right? And the uh, old conversation with uh, Buddhist scholarship yes. is remarkable. We opened the door for this. Yeah. Um, Interesting, you didn't mention death. Yeah. I'm just, you know, we're talking higher. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I'm yeah. wondering if death is part of your conversation Absolutely, here about yeah. the background, the yeah. outgoing of life. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I think this was one of Heidegger's great frustrations in terms of the reception and reading of being in time was a misunderstanding, as he felt it, of the account of, of being towards death. I, you know, I just to say very simple things for a second. He, he's trying to emphasize in that text, I'm not interested in biological perishing. I'm not interested okay. in parent. And he's not even particularly interested in demise or ablation. He's interested in being towards death. Yeah. Being towards death is a way to live. Our own most possibility. Yeah. yeah. The null basis of the nullity. But he's getting at there, if you 
if you execute the analysis, this is the way I read Hunger and this is consistent. But if you if you read him the way I do in terms of being in time, it's it's a related attempt to do everything that he's doing in what is metaphysics notion of nothing. That we we don't begin with some sort of deep constant underlying principles which inform the way we think. We are thrown into a situation that's already meaningful. Meaningfulness is happening, just happening. It's already there. And death is a, as a horizon, the being towards that. So the, the idea of being within radically finite and as opposed to this sort of eternal continuum, that's precisely part of how we're thrown and that's part of how the sense making happens. So I think the death just goes right to the very heart of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Various meditation techniques and Buddhism, where one wakes every day and tries to think every breath that one's almost possibly for death. Yeah. To make, to, to, again, not to be morbid, but to realize your life, your consciousness, yeah. your yeah. mindfulness. Which, I mean, and then there's obvious things you can do with the account of authenticity there, not understood in, in the way it's sometimes read in an almost sort of normative or, or ethical. Way, but simply a, a part of the sense making. How sense making happens. Yeah. So we'll move to uh, Lisa Foran from UCD. Uh, she says, "Thank you for the great paper, Mahon. Could you ad address the question of responsibility?" Heidegger seems quite clear that our usual understanding of responsibility and indebtedness is is itself a part of a representational mode of thought. And that releasement itself depends on a kind of waiting to be appropriated. So, is there any sense in which we must actively allow for passive active mindfulness to happen? What would that entail? Uh, it, well, there's a way in which I think what Lisa's is characterizing there is what Heidegger thinks thinking itself involves. Um, because the, 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 the representational mode of thought is already in itself a, a blocking of, for example, something as simple as the letting a thing be a thing. Uh, and it, it, there's a sense in which uh, for, for people who think of Heidegger and, and Gelassenheit and, and this notion of letting and letting be as, uh, as relevant only to his later thought, again, I would say here that if you look at the introduction to being in time, the whole emphasis is on the role that letting doing in phenomenology. That attempt is already there from the very, very beginning. Um, in terms of our responsibility, if, if you think of the, the, however one wants to call it, the, uh, the event of appropriation, or what's probably awkwardly translated as an only, there, this constant fascination that meaningfulness is happening. It happens, we're claimed by it, we're not in control of it. It's, it's not. It's not like sort of subjects going around discreetly conferring meaning on things. That, that we're part of something that's happening. And we don't have ownership or or authorship over it in that way. Um, and that that's also then going to be further related to the fact that there's different historical shapes that, that seem to govern or, or or direct or ordain the way uh, or what characteristic of that the way meaningfulness is happening in any given era. And again, in terms of responsibility, the, the most that we can charge ourselves with being responsible for is thinking, I think, the conditions under which that's happening and allowing for the possibility that another mode of revealing may show itself. But, you know, is that quietism? Uh, I don't personally think so, but he's quite clear, for example, again, in the memorial address that you know, that there's no single group of individuals or, or no single individual or group of individuals that can just change the course of this history in, in terms of the way he's thinking about the history of the unfolding of the metaphysical present. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Lisa, hopefully, but I, it's, a, it's an important one. Okay, I'll uh, abuse my <laughs> position as a, a chair and ask a, a question. Um, so don't contradict me. Uh, no, yes, of course. <laughs> um, so you've referred to the memorial address uh, where he uh, Heidegger defines Gelassenheit as a kind of uh, a both yes and no, uh, so as to illuminate the let's say structure of mindfulness. 
Is that correct? In a way? Uh, well, in a way, I suppose what I was trying to just bring out is that when he's talking about, uh, when he's using cognitive terms to this in, in, in the memorial address, we, we, the English is translated as meditative thinking. So mindfulness obviously then goes hand in hand with meditative thinking, and obviously the last night is the same thing as to think, okay. so think they, meditatively and not calculatively, of course, in that capacity. Right. So it, um, would you say, because that's the way I understand Gelassenheit would be as a form of opening up to a kind of relativism, ontological relativism in some specific uh, sense, mm -hmm. uh, and which goes hand in hand with his ontological plural, pluralism, I would say. Uh, and so that he, uh, Heidegger would say there are various ways in which things uh, or being meaningfully discloses itself. Uh, so I take it that mindfulness is connected to this form or sort of pluralism, that it wants you to become a, a sort of pluralist. However, would there be, I think, I mean, I don't know if there's an answer to this, would there be a way to prioritize though, depending on the context, which uh, way of revealing uh, which, ontologia, which ontology is better suited in each case? So I will give a specific concrete example. We have lived through the, the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And I have seen a few uh, Heideggerians um, on the basis of these ideas, I've said, question the uh, question science or question you know, the findings of science in mm -hmm. how we should behave, whether we should accept yeah, yeah, yeah. the scientific findings yeah. and then abuse this relativism so as to question science in a way that, in my opinion, is uh, not really supported from Heidegger. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and in that context, I, I would say in this context, uh, the scientific findings do have a priority. However, I am not sure how to justify from within Heidegger's discourse or analysis uh, how we would prioritize science yeah. in this context. Yeah, yeah, no, it's an, it's an important that's it's an important thing to get straight on because he's he's not a luddite, and he's also not anti-science. Um, but so one way of thinking about this is, and I, I think this is the issue he has with Gestel. Uh, if if you have a science that's, it sounds awkward now, but bear with me, that is perhaps ontologically blind. Uh, then the the temptation becomes that that's the the only way to look at this is is in the following way, right? So take a, if you take this jug example, which I know is not a medical one, but that all that the jug means is this material thing that's been described, and it's not empty because it's filled with one thing and it's now replaced with another. When th there are multiple ways of of Thinking about the job. So the, the if we if we move that then into the domain of what you're thinking about, it's you have the epidemiologist, for example, or someone like that who's looking at what we should do in certain situations. And then and and I mean I, I share your skepticism about the way certain thinkers would want to challenge that. I thought some of it was was wrong-headed, and I don't think Heidegger himself would agree. The thought would be then though that any political decision at all during this entire period can only be looked at through the lens of that. And that temptation to, to just to, to narrow everything such that that's the only way it can be thought of. I think that's what he's trying to resist. Uh, I mean, I, I'm talking very loosely, but I, I, don't, I don't want to not talk about your example. So then it would be the idea that if you're thinking about how it is that we should comport ourselves and how we should uh, interact, and, and that the, the only account anymore involved is the one that the, the let's say the, the medical person at the lectern that we all saw every evening in all of our respective countries, that's the only viewpoint. And I think that would be a mistake for him. Would you uh, uh, equate that with a form of mindlessness? Like, let's say, <laughs> this, I, like, I like think mindlessly, uh, you know, uh, following all the, um, well, you know, a particular science uh, as the only form of truth. 
I, I think he thinks that uh, that any such interpretation uh, that is eliminative in that way, or imagine someone who's able to, to give you a, a very, very elegant mathematical account of what makes Beethoven's Ninth Symphony wonderful, and then says that any other description is, well, that's folksy or that's sentimental or that's folk psychopathy. I don't know, folk psychological is probably the wrong term, and that it should be replaced by this. I think that's the kind of thing he's worried about. And calculated thinking, I think he believes, is, is to think in that way. Okay, so thank you very much. We have uh, five more minutes. So two questions. First, Hariri Mostukas, and then uh, Hans Georg Ellenberger in, uh, on the chat. Thank you, Christmas. It is not so much a question as an observation. Uh, I like very much your example for the pandemic and also Machen's response that indeed the excessive sanitization of the response to the pandemic would be an indication of calculated thinking. And I think the Heideggerian view so nicely captured in the, in the quote you put up, Machen, about the yes and no, I think that conveys, it says it all. You know, you use science obviously to fight something like pandemic, poverty, whatever. At the same time, you do realize that this is not the, you know, it does not exhaust what human existence is all about. And I think it's an important corrective. By the way, I use, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a social scientist. And I use, I teach management students. I use the Padigas um, uh, memorial address in my teaching. And that's yes and no, that, that kind of pendulum. And I find the properly explained, it is quite revealing to students particularly technologically minded and calculatively thinking students as management students tend to be. And because it brings out this, uh, this surplus of meaning, which calculative thinking alone cannot capture. Yeah. So thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you for the comment. I, it uh, reminds me of a, an example I use with my students. Uh, one day I realized I was no longer one of the students and I was old, or much older, uh, was when I started telling following story because I would say, you know, there was a time when I was an undergraduate and a week previous, you'd say to someone, uh, I'll meet you next Thursday at 6.15 on, in the Thirsty Scholar uh, on Western Road near University College Cork for a pint. And an entire week would go by, there would be no texting, there would be no changing, it, it would, that was an appointment, that was what it was to meet someone. And now suddenly, I mean, I don't meet someone until I'm sitting at the table and there's been a confirmation I'll be there in 30 seconds. Up until then, it's all for grabs. Anything could happen. It's entirely changed what it means for us to make an appointment, to meet someone, to agree. And it's not like any of us decided to do that. Just somehow it happened. And again, I, I share, I share your, your view on this. I think he would say we need to be able to say no as well. In my case, uh, I leave the phone outside the bedroom. Took me a while to get used to it. <laughs> a great uh, pub name. Is it a real pub? The, the thirsty scholar. Yeah. Thirsty scholar. Thirsty scholar. Yeah. 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 I, I spent a, a lot of time in there. Uh, so the last question is. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Two questions. One is uh, Pierre. Yeah, we skipped it by accident. Let's just go back to Pierre's uh, question, which is, is there a philosophical exercise, a training that could be practiced to foster mindfulness in the Heideggerian way, similar to mindfulness meditation? Or is the very idea of a training linked to calculative thinking? Oh, that's a nice question. Um... It's, it's tricky answering questions like that one, I think, on Heidegger, because Heidegger, as, as you indicated, very seriously engaged with, with Eastern thinkers at different times and had serious conversations with them. And then yet in these other moments, he'll make uh, not disparaging comments, but very, very clear comments that in order to get to where Western thinking needs to, it has to have what he sees almost as this internal conversation. And of course, I mean, there's a bit of megalomania here as well. And that involves retracing my steps back to the history of Western metaphysics to this conceptual moment and thinking about it in the way that I am. So that 
there's a sense in which Heidegger, for various reasons, forecloses the possibility of, of thinking in that way, which of course is not to say that, that we can't think about it ourselves. Um, but I, I would think that there's there's something about uh, the the this very 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 sort of profound uh, he sees it as almost sort of earth shaking experience or capacity to think about the if you like whether there's a you know or the, the intersection of being and nothingness or that as he'd say in the mindfulness volume that different times he says things almost like being is nothing and nothing is being trying to get one's head around that is where he's at i think all the time and i think he believes that if you think that thought through with some sort of care it, it has extraordinary implications um not least in terms of diagnosing what he sees as the calculative nature of uh, the way people think in the technological age how we exist in the technological era in the way that we do and, and so on um, it's difficult to say something more specific about whether there's a kind of a practice um, so the last question i think connects to the penultimate one uh, 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 hans georg eilenberger says thanks for the paper mahon i learned a lot of new things about heidegger could you perhaps give examples of cultural practices that embody mindfulness in the Heideggerian sense? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm going to say something that's going to be controversial. And Francesco, no one's saying that's slightly tongue in cheek. But, I mean, you could read Holderlin um, uh, or you know, think about what he calls great works of art um, or, or, or poetry. Um, I, I think one thing, again, and th this is where we can, we can go a little bit beyond what Heidegger said. So again, Heidegger is going to foreclose things in terms of what's available for that kind of meaningful engagement with, let's say, a, an artistic, call it object, uh, artificially, um, and say that, it, well, it can only happen with sort of maybe some ancient Greek things and, and some German things, and that's related to a very, very problematic intellectual mindset we had, which is not actually peculiar to Heidegger at all, which would be some intellectual history. Um, but I do think that he believes, uh, at least this is what I tried to do in, in a recent piece that's coming out, but I, I tried to do it again in, um, in a book some years back on the Heidegger controversy, is to just look at the way uh, certain writers or poets um, and seem to just get at this sort of unusual uh, tension between the, the, what he called in his early life the, the desire for the absolute over against this, what he seems to be this, he called it the undeniable fact of relativity, which again is, is related to some of the things we're thinking about here. Uh, and, I, and I think he thinks that you can see certain artists, certain writers, certain poets, uh, allowing you to get a glimpse into that meaningfulness happening for a people or for an historical people at a, a given time. Again, the, the way he forecloses that account himself in the direction of, of a kind of a uh, ultra Germanic way of thinking about things in origin of the work of art elsewhere. I think you can put that to one side and just examine how certain types of, of writing allow you to, to see that emerge, um, the, the sort of the undeniably local over against the desire for the absolute, which in between that tension meaningfulness is being worked out. Uh, that's very garbled, which I'm putting down to the three hours on the runway and that was and not being sort of super kind of time last night. But um, if, if you want to write to me, Directly, I can maybe give you a, a more concrete answer and, and send you some, some work on that. Okay, I think uh, we've run out of time. Uh, let us uh, thank Mahon O'Brien for his amazing talk. And we will take a two minute break, literally two minutes, and we'll be back uh, with the further talk. Thank you.